Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar hosted by the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations. I'm Lisa Fox and I'm the principal investigator for NCPMI and I'm host or planner for the Within the Framework webinar series that you've joined. So today we're going to record the webinar and it'll be available later on our website. Um, we're going to dedicate all the time we have in this webinar to the panel presentation. That's a little different than we've done in the past. So we're not going to take questions, but we definitely want to hear from you. So please make free use of the chat as we um, explore this topic together and let us know your thoughts. And please respond to the evaluation um, and give us your reflections and also your interest about this really important topic. So today what we're talking about and what we've titled this as is a conversation about development, developing and implementing individualized interventions for children who've experienced trauma. Um, I'm gonna stop talking. I asked my colleague, Jackie Joseph from Denver University to guide the panel discussion. And she has three guests with us who have agreed to join us for this really important conversation. So Jackie, I'm going to turn it to you. Thank you, Lisa. I also want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. And as Lisa said, I'll be our facilitator today. And I'm joined by three very accomplished panelists who each bring a wealth of expertise and experience from their work and from their fields. We have um, Julia Sales with us. Karis Vaman and Blair Lloyd, who will all be sharing their insights and knowledge throughout our conversation. And in, in a moment, they'll briefly share a little bit more about their perspectives and what they bring to our conversation today. You can also find their full bios on the NCPMI website to learn more about them. And on that same page, as most of you probably already know, we've linked the first part to today's webinar that inspired this deeper conversation or part two, um, in addition to some other resources, including the guide to pyramid model uh, and trauma-informed care. So Today's discussion will be focusing on implementing individualized positive behavior support with children and families who have experienced trauma. And trauma, as we'll continue to discuss throughout today's webinar, overwhelms a child's ability to cope with frightening events. And it can result from ongoing abuse or witnessing violence or from a single traumatic event like a natural disaster. And it has a significant impact on children's developing brains and it can impact their abilities to attend or regulate their emotions or learn and communicate. And while experiencing trauma can have a significant impact, on, on young children, caregiving adults can offer young children and families really important and valuable support. And along these lines, today we're going to discuss individualized positive behavior support as a compassionate approach that considers the impact on trauma, the impact of trauma on children's behaviors and emotions and um, how teams can use a trauma-informed lens as they're developing and implementing behavior support plans. It is important to clarify though, that today when we're talking about individualized positive behavior support and behavior support plans, we are talking about developing those to really support children whose behaviors challenge us as adults, not to address or alleviate a child's traumatic stress. And so that means that we'll be talking about teams using this process that you see in front of you on this slide. And our conversation today will follow the steps in this process and our panelists will use the, the language and the practices outlined in the individualized positive behavior support process. So um, very briefly, first we establish a collaborative team and set goals, including 
um, the family, absolutely, as members on that team, and sometimes even, you know, children, if appropriate. And then we will gather information through functional assessment and understand what a child is communicating through the use of their behavior. We'll develop a, hypothe a hypothesis statement, which is the best guess that we have for why the behavior um, is being used and what the child's using the behavior to communicate. And then the team develops a behavior support plan and then implements the plan and collects data to ensure that what they're, they're doing is working and refines the plan um, as everybody is making progress and feeling confident and competent about that. So as our panelists chat today, again, they'll use the language and strategies outlined in this process. And we do know that many of you are joining for the practical inf inf information that you love from the pyramid model and, and NCPMI. So our presenters are going to try to highlight at least one or two immediately applicable considerations as we, we chat through the questions that we have prepared for today. But we do really wanna emphasize that following this process, implementing the behavior support plan with both a trauma-informed lens and a culturally responsive sustaining lens are the key takeaways for today's webinar. So with that hopeful grounding to get us all on the same page, uh, we can go ahead and stop sharing our our slides. And what I think would be really helpful for everybody is for all of us just to give a brief lens in terms of what we're bringing to today's conversation. And I, I can go first to model this for us. So I am Jackie, as we already know. <laughs> um, and I think that the reason Lisa asked me to facilitate today's discussion is because a lot of my work has been in the area of individualized positive behavior support, prevent, teach, reinforce for young children or PTRYC. Uh, also before coming to the education field, I was a clinical social worker and I worked with many young children and families who have experienced trauma. And um, I'm, a, I'm a mom of two young children, one who just happens to have a rare genetic syndrome. So much of my work now is in inclusion and belonging. And I think that I bring that lens of first, we have to feel safe and know that we belong to then learn and accomplish and achieve um, all, the, all that we can do. So um, Karis, did you want to go ahead and offer us some information about what you're bringing today? Sure, uh, Jackie, and thank you for your model. Um, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up. Excellent. Well, I am excited to be here for this conversation. Um, I uh, feel that um, Dr. Fox, Lisa has asked me to be part of this panel, particularly because of the lens that I bring um, as a woman of color. I am also the mother of a three-year-old boy, and so I, who is now um, in a childcare setting. And so I am always aware of the climate and the experience that um, we collectively experience in his childcare uh, environment. I also um, approach the FBA process, integrating um, my understanding of early child development um, in the behavior su support process to address the whole child. Typically, um, the process is um, conducted in isolation without that uh, child development perspective. And so um, that's an additional lens that I bring, as well as um, knowledge of how to support families of color through the process. Thank you. Um... Julia, would you like to go next? Sure. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you all so much for having me here today. My name is Julia Sales, and I'm a licensed mental health clinician by training. I specialize in infant and early childhood mental health, and I spent many years in community mental health, serving kids um, clinically and their families who had experienced trauma, um, who've experienced great number, a great deal of stress. Um, and I've also been a mental health consultant for a variety of different um, 
early education and care settings. And so I have helped to support and think about some of the kids we think may have experienced trauma or may know have experienced trauma. Think about how we really support them within a program setting. Think about how we support them in a classroom setting. And to me, most importantly, help to build the capacity of the adults who are caring for them to make sure that they can be that good relational safety net. So I am so excited to be here today with you all. Thank you, Julia. Blair, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. And thanks so much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I'm Blair Lloyd. I'm an associate professor of special education at Vanderbilt. And my, um, my training background is primarily as a behavior analyst. So in applied behavior analysis within a, a special education sort of school focused context. And my research focuses primarily on the functional behavior assessment and um, individualized behavior support process for children in um, elementary grades, including early elementary. Um, and I have a specific interest in supporting children, um, students with or at risk for developing emotional behavioral disorders, many of whom um, do have histories of trauma. And my experiences, you know, um, evaluating behavioral interventions for these kids have really opened my eyes to um, what I consider to be some blind spots from a sort of a purely uh, behavior analytic lens and um, has really sort of taught me the importance of partnering with mental health professionals and, and really working to develop more sort of integrated interdisciplinary interventions. Um, so I do want to be clear, you know, in this conversation that my expertise is really more on the functional assessment and behavior intervention side. Um, I, I don't have, you know, um, a, a wealth of expertise in trauma and certainly not, you know, um, interventions to treat trauma, but I am a very eager uh, collaborator um, in this area and a, and a firm believer that our, that our behavioral interventions will be more effective um, when they integrate the, the, the lens of trauma um, into them. So thanks, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. So let's just go ahead and get started because I had the honor of chatting with all of you last week as we were talking through some of the questions we might ask. And I said, we should have just recorded this because this could have been the the webinar. I, I didn't ever want that conversation to end. But um, the first question I have is for Karis. And this relates to that initiating the process step of um, individualized positive behavior support. So when a child who you know has had experiences of trauma and they also have behavior that's challenging adults, what are some considerations for initiating the behavior support process that that you would you would take or that you can recommend? Yeah, so um, traditionally, uh, some traditional approaches to initiating the process, um, particularly from a behavior analyst perspective, is that we often ask, start off asking questions about what is the problem behavior and where is the context in which the behavior is happening. And, um, and so when you're initiating that process, it starts with, uh, when you're incorporating a trauma-informed lens, it starts with the kinds of questions that you're ans answering or asking. So you're not problematizing the child. So you might ask questions instead of what is the problem behavior, or in addition to what is the problem behavior and where is the behavior occurring, you might ask, well, what has happened to the child and what do they need um, to be able to uh, effectively communicate? Um, and so you want to ask questions that frame your understanding of how to respond to trauma as opposed to the behavior to support the child moving forward. Um, and I believe um, Julia is going to talk about the four hours later, uh, but part of asking the right questions is helping us think through ahead of time of how to resist re-traumatizing um, children. And so... Um, in addition to thinking about broadening the types of questions that are asked, you also want to broaden who's included on the team. So you wanna think very carefully and comprehensively about um, this collaborative process and who it will be included on the team. Um, and that might include a mental health uh, specialist or a social worker um, or a school psychologist to help, um, again, be able to address the comprehensive or the global needs of the child as opposed to just focusing on the problem behavior in a very isolated context. And then finally, um, on this theme of really broadening our questions and, and how we're 
um, recognizing trauma um, or using a trauma-informed lens and also broadening who we're including on the team within this collaborative approach, we want to broaden um, what we are including in the FBA process. So um, in uh, NCPMI's uh, trauma-informed trauma -informed care guide, they um uh, they mention six principles of trauma-informed care. And so when you're initiating this process, you wanna kind of think ahead about how are you gonna embed those six principles into the FBA process, particularly focusing on um, relational safety. Um, so who are those um, individuals within the school setting or the preschool program setting that can help provide those safe supports and perhaps even implement the intervention um, for the particular child? Thanks, Karis. Did any, Julia or Blair, did you have other things to, to add to that about initiating the process? Sure, I can hop in if that's okay. I'm just looking in the chat too. I see Julia's comment in here and I just wanna make sure um, Today, we're really thinking about if we do know a child has experienced trauma, but I think we also need to hold that trauma-informed care is best practice for every single child because there are going to be times that we don't know, right? And so if we are thinking through this lens, um, it, it's going to help to support every single child that we go through this process with and their families as well. And it's going to also help to build that adult capacity in using these different techniques so that we get comfortable with it and we can really deepen our practice. Um, so one thing I think about, and Karis, thank you for giving a nice little preview of this, is this idea of the four R's. And this comes out of SAMHSA when we're thinking about trauma-informed care. And it's really sort of four different questions we can be asking ourselves. And I think it's it's a great way to ground the group as we're starting the behavior support process. Um, and so the first question or the first R that we're going to think about is this idea of realizing. And so like Kara said, how are we making sure that we are saying what's happened to this child? What's happened for this family? What's the experience been like? If we don't know, what's our best guess? What do we think might have happened, right? So how are we in that reflective space? We're then thinking about recognizing and this really lens and leans on this idea of when we're thinking through that trauma-informed lens, we want to hold that we know traumatic experiences change brain architecture, right? We know that those big stressful events impact the way a developing child's brain develops and works. We also know that healing goes hand in hand with that. We know that the importance of relationships and all these things we're going to talk about are so important for that piece. But we want to recognize that as we're looking at this behavior, um, we're thinking about it through that lens. What do I know about brain science? What do I know about trauma-informed care? And how am I making sense or how am I bringing that into the space as we're thinking about this behavior as well? We also want to make sure that um, when we're thinking about our responses to behaviors that we're holding, um, again, the idea of these four R's. As I'm responding, am I making sure that we are supporting and building that adult capacity to respond to that child? Is that woven in there? Are we thinking about skill building for that child within that relational space? Are we also thinking about um, how we know when that good relationship is intact when it's there and we're helping to build some of those skills through our plan, right? We may see the behavior decrease, we may not, but we recognize that healing is going to happen. So we're not saying we're gonna heal your big T trauma within a classroom, but we're saying the responses that we have, um, we can resist re-traumatizing, but we can also promote and support healing. And when that relationship is there, that really comes online and is supported. And then last but not least, we always want to make sure whatever we're putting into our plan, let's look at it through a critical lens of saying, is this resisting re-traumatization? Is this a place where um, we're making sure that we are safe and we're supportive and that we're promoting again, that idea of, of growth? Yeah, I think that um, what I heard you both say there are, you know, a great perspective for us to take when we're initiating the process is always start with a trauma-informed lens. Um, there's this concept in um, that's called, you know, make the least dangerous assumption. And I think mm -hmm. that it's so in line with, with making the least dangerous assumption, always starting with the trauma-informed lens, because, you know, like both of you said, these are really good practices for any child and family. And um, as we also know that partnering with families is is so important for 
you know, children's development in general, and especially when we're we're engaging in the individualized um, positive behavior support process. So, Karis, I have another question for you. Um, how do you build trust and collaboration with families who may be experiencing their own trauma-related challenges? Yes, well, I uh, just want to echo Dr. Lloyd's sentiments, and I am not an expert on on this at all uh, as it comes to, uh, as it relates to family partnering with families in schools. I am I'm kind of stumbling my way through uh, this process myself, but I can share a few things with you that I felt has been successful in my um, work with partnering with families. Um, so uh, first, I think it would be important to recognize when families need help. And sometimes families might share this information with you willingly, or you might gather this information from other child care teachers, um, but there needs to be a process for kind of recognizing, as uh, Julie has shared, recognizing signs of trauma, not just with the child, but with the family as well. Um, because we know that families exist, children exist within systems and families exist within systems. And so um, families are clearly directed, our families are clearly um, impacted by um, trauma as well. And one way to do this, obviously, is to know the signs of trauma um, and uh, as it relates to the child and the family. But um, I've thought about this as a uh, when I take my child to the pediatrician, there's kind of an intake form that I have to complete. And they ask me, do I have housing? Have I been harmed by anyone? Um, and I think the third, uh, oh, do I have access to food? And so there are all these indicators that they have you check off to see if you have experienced trauma or if you need any sort of support. And I think this should be part of the child care uh, program system. And regularly, um, this data should be collected regularly, not just annually, but maybe monthly or weekly or whatever is feasible for what child care programs feel is feasible to kind of gather that data um, from families because they may not verbally tell you that something um, is going on. Maybe they're, they might feel that um, they might be um, punished or um, perhaps they might uh, feel shamed, but they might write this information down and slip it to someone that they feel comfortable with in the child care program. Um, so first recognizing when families need help is the first step to learning how to partner with families. And then how do we respond? So thinking about these four R's again, how do we respond to families once they've identified um, that they uh, need help? Well, that response actually should occur before they <laughs> before a problem has been identified, right? When we think about preventative strategies within the pyramid model of support for uh, when thinking about children, um, that same approach should be applied with families, right? What should we be doing for all families universally, right? So we should be doing the end take, right? We should be building um, positive relationships and assuming positive regard. And then there might be some tier two or tier three strategies that we might want to apply for specific families that um, need um, more individualized or intensive supports. Um, and then um, I another way to partner with families is find out what's been working for them at home during um, the FBA process. Families are experts of their children, right? They have strengths. Um, and so there might be some things that have been working for them at home that could be evidence-based, believe it or not, um, but they might not know that they're evidence-based. And so have a conversation with families, find out what's working and engineer some of those practices uh, into the classroom and have partner with them in, in supporting those practices in the classroom. Um, so finally, um, I'll just mention really quickly, thinking about the nested systems approach, I think I um, jumped, uh, I've addressed that. Um, and then finally, with thinking through um, the childcare climate, it's so, so critically important um, in partnering with families. And families, you may not have to say anything to them, but they can um, get a sense of the energy in the um, childcare environment just by how you communicate with them, how you communicate, what you communicate, what you say. Um, and so I think learning how to communicate with families that assume positive regard is really important. And then building connections around their passions as part of communicating. So finding out what they're interested in and building connections around that. And then finally thinking about um, having a community uh, liaison in the um, child care center or preschool program is really important because families may not necessarily connect with you, which is okay, but they might com connect with that community li liaison. And there needs to be someone in that child care program that they have a mutual uh, positive relationship with that can serve as like um, a, a bridge between the family and um, 
um, the child care center. This could be a business owner in the community, someone who runs a hair salon or a barbershop. It could be a chief of a community or religious leader of sorts, but there needs to be some sort of representation um, so that uh, families know that this is their uh, child care center too. Yeah, you brought up a really um, good point, Karis, when you were talking about um, gathering all of that information in the FBA um, process. And um, Blair, could you share any insights that you have into how a trauma-informed perspective influences the understanding of the functions of behavior, especially as it relates to, um, which I, I I don't know if it was in, in the chat in this webinar or in the last one, but so how we can use our trauma-informed perspective to understand children's challenging behavior, given all of those amazing points that Karis made, but especially, and especially when it relates to children's needs to obtain or avoid escape situations, as we think of those kind of standard reasons for why children might use challenging behavior. Yeah, so I think it's important to think about our, you know, one of the main reasons why we want to identify the function certain challenging behaviors are serving is that it really helps us identify like a need that that behavior is currently meeting so that we can then identify a different way for the child to access that need, you know, usually by teaching them new replacement skills to make sure that need is met. And um, another part of uh, identifying the function is really so that we can identify what we think of as like a motivating context to teach those new replacement behaviors or those new skills. And I think where the trauma lens comes in is in really um, carefully considering the difference between a motivating condition that's going to support learning new skills and a, a, a stressful condition that's going to shut down any opportunities to learn new skills. Um, and, you know, every child is going to be unique in terms of the point at which, you know, a, a motivating condition for learning is going to become, is going to tip over into a stressful condition that's really going to, you know, decrease the likelihood that they're, that they're even, you know, open to, um, to learning new things. So I think for some kids, it could be, um, you know, really dialing down that motivating condition so to decrease the likelihood that it that it will you know become stressful. So for example, if behaviors might be attention motivated or if the you know the the unmet need identified through the functional assessment is you know related to accessing adult attention, then maybe you know having the adult just walk away from the child completely, you know, without explanation is is, is not is not a motivating condition to um, to teach appropriate ways to to recruit that attention, but a stressful one. And so maybe instead dialing down that that um, condition might look look something like, you know, the teacher just sitting right beside the child, uh, you know, right near them and maybe, you know, gently orienting his or her attention, you know, to another activity to, um, you know, to decrease the likelihood or, or, you know, to show that they're still available, they're still available, um, but the, the child may need to tap them on the shoulder or, you know, say something to get their attention. Um, I think for other kids though, especially ones where, you know, it's, it's clear from their behavior or their um, avoidance or withdrawal within the classroom that they may not be at a place where teaching skills is the right first step. So maybe for them, you know, a, a starting point might be something like, you know, for the next um, two weeks, we are going to maximize the number of positive adult child interactions that this child has in the classroom to, you know, make them feel safe and supported in this classroom environment so that we can then get to a place where, you know, we feel more comfortable um, targeting and teaching new skills. Um, so that's one factor. I think another factor to think about as it relates especially to um, functions involving avoidance or escape is that, you know, if you, if an FBA, results of an FBA suggest that um, a child's engaging in behaviors to avoid or escape something, then that, that means that part of their environment is, is inherently punishing or coercive, you know, if they're motivated to escape some aspect of their, their environment. So in those cases, you know, rather than trying to teach the child to sort of work through those tough situations, 
um, especially for children with histories of trauma, I think it can be helpful to really take a step back and figure out what are the punishing elements of this classroom environment um, to begin with. And, and by the way, I'm not saying that that teachers are purposely implementing punish, punishing practices. I'm not even saying that. But if, if behaviors are motivated to escape something, then we know something is aversive in that classroom. And so we can take a step back and try to identify, okay, how do we make the classroom more inviting, make aspects of instruction more inviting and positively reinforcing to, you know, just dial, dial down the, the motivation to escape those conditions um, at, at all. So I think, you know, a lot, a lot of these strategies, um, I think involve sort of taking a step back and making sure that, you know, we can try to neutralize any stressful conditions that are present in the classroom and take initial steps to make, um, you know, to increase the likelihood that a, that a child feels safe and responded to and, and supported in that, in that classroom setting. Whoops, I was on mute. Um, thank you for that, Blair. I think, Julia, this, this might be something that you could, um, you know, offer some perspective on to um, related to developing the behavior support plan and and strategies. Um, do you have an example to share about how understanding the child's trauma experience might influence the selection of strategies? As Blair started to talk about a bit related to um, preventing and responding to behaviors that that we would outline in a behavior support plan. Sure, I'd love to. Thanks, Jackie. Um, and thank you, Blair, for laying that out so beautifully. I think that it can get really complicated, right, when we start to really get down and thinking about all the different pieces. And so um, here's a story that maybe helps to sort of think through that trauma-informed lens and what some of those strategies looked like. So um, I think it's important to remember that sometimes for kids who've experienced trauma, the behavior that they're showing that's a challenging to adults has been a protective factor for them or a protective behavior for them. It may be, have been imperative to their survival, right? So I think about a child I worked with um, many years ago who experienced some neglect. And so one of the ways he was able to get his needs met at his house was he would climb up on the countertops and then he would climb up on the top of the fridge and he would bang on the cabinets and he would yell and he would scream. And that's how he got his need met to be fed. Um, and so what that looked like then when he came into school was that he was up on the tables, he had the big long wooden block, you know, the big one, like the really long one, and he's swinging that around and he's like, yeah, here we are, I'm getting my needs met. He had learned, right, that this is what I need to do. I need to get up and I need to get big and I need to get on tables and I need to scream and that's the way I get my basic needs met. Right. And so what that looked like, having that understanding and perspective and the school was really lucky. This child had come into um, foster care because of some of the neglectful situations and that foster family was part of the team. They were able to share some of this backstory, which was really helpful in thinking about uh, making the plan. Right. But part of the strategies that were put in place was we didn't jump right to get down off the tables or, oh, we're not being safe. Let's calm down. We need to be safe in school. Or you can say, I need help. He wasn't able to access any of those strategies just yet. What he needed was really thinking about that relational safety. He needed to feel safe in his environment. And so when he was getting up on tables and he was saying, I'm really big, look at me. He was sort of saying, I'm not feeling safe here. I don't feel safe. I'm not sure. This is a new environment for me. I'm with a new family. I need to get my needs met. And so one thing that they implemented, which I'm not saying this is for everyone. This is a great example of how we can individualize, right? Individualize strategies. So, okay, just take that with a grain of salt as I tell you what happened next. They decided they knew that food had been a big part of his neglect and he was really seeking that as a basic need when he was getting up on the tables. And so um, they implemented a snack basket that went with him everywhere. So this snack basket went outside, the snack basket went on the bus, the snack basket went in the car, it went to circle time, it went everywhere. And the idea was not, oh, let's just feed him anytime he wants. The idea was to show him we understand, given your experiences, that 
sometimes you didn't have access to something you really needed. And so we're going to give you access to that anytime you need it to help create that relational safety. And so when he did choose a snack, he had to sit down next to the teacher and the teacher opened it and they had a nice back and forth. And so as we were creating that environmental safety through that snack basket, we were also creating that relational safety with those nice one-on-one -on -one interactions. So the snack basket lived for about six weeks. There was a whole piece of work that went to the rest of the class around why do we have a snack basket for him, right? We did all that good work, empathy building, understanding, um, and then he didn't need it anymore. And we were able to start to work on another skill. But had we skipped that step, right, we probably would not have seen a reduction in that behavior. He'd probably still be jumping around, waving that big block or um, something else would have happened, right? Some other, he might not have been able to be retained in the program. Who knows what would have happened next? But just again, thinking about the importance of how we understand some of those experiences and how we think about how they can be integrated into our plan. Um, and I think too, another big piece is really recognizing that so many of the pyramid model strategies for prevention are trauma-informed. So that's my favorite place to live. We're gonna do more support and help really thinking about those preventative pieces. So are we using things like individualized schedules? We know kids who've experienced trauma oftentimes have not had a lot of predictability or a lot of consistency in some of the environments they've been in. They might not know who's coming to pick them up. They might not know where they're going to sleep. Um, they might have been moved from home to home, right? And so if we can provide that predictability and consistency through walking through our daily schedule, first we come in. We hang up our coats, then we go and we do some free play, then we go and we have circle, then we're going to have some small groups, then we're going to have lunch, right? When we are able to walk through that in a consistent and predictable way, that's going to support our kids in sequencing time, that's going to help them to feel safe and secure in their environment, um, and, and so that's huge. Another really big preventative strategy that I always like to stress is the importance of emotional literacy, right? So when we have adults in our programs who are able to support kids um, in identifying their feelings, and so this might mean that the adult is identifying and naming their own feelings, and they're doing that with that big, bright face, right? Or they're mirroring their face. Oh, you're so angry right now. You're showing me you're angry, right? I'm going to mirror that look at you. Yes, you feel proud. Look at you, right? We're going to have the big reaction. For our kids who've experienced trauma, it can be tricky to understand all the different feelings that are happening inside, right? I think for all of our kids at this age, but especially for our kids who've experienced trauma. And so when we're able to promote and really highlight the importance of the adult role as it relates to emotional literacy, so not just showing the feelings faces and saying, how do you feel? I need to be actively modeling that across the day. That's really going to support kids and starting to say, wow, I can start to understand how I might be feeling inside. I can start to extend that range of feelings and emotions. Um, and that's really going to support kids and their behavior, but it's also really going to support them in their regulation, right? They're going to be able to start to say, I have a different skill to use. I can change my behavior. I can maybe use the skills that relates to friendships. And we know um, that that piece is really important too, as, as it, we zoom out and think about a child's overall healing too from trauma. Um, so just wanted to pop those two in there. Yeah, no, I think that's really helpful. I heard you say really understanding the child's experience of trauma and that unmet need. Um, and even maybe creatively incorporating that into, into behavior support plans. And I know um, I've heard many of you before say this concept of kind of slow down to go farther, right? And really working as much as we can to build that relationship and remembering that the pyramid model strategies are trauma informed um, or most, you know, um, many of them, all of them are, you know, especially if you're having that trauma informed lens, I guess is what I would say. And we're remembering to have that, that lens um, and um, an emotional literacy as well. Right. And so um, I think I, I had two questions there and I think I maybe started reading one and, and also combined it, but maybe this would be a, a great place, Julia, if you have additional strategies to to consider or Karis or Blair, um, if you have any other thoughts about developing the behavior support plan with that trauma-informed lens um, 
you know, and identifying other prevention strategies or teach strategies or, or reinforce strategies that we might include in the in the behavior support plan. Um, any like specific ex additional examples or considerations that that anybody would share? I have one I can I can add um, just on the prevention side. And I don't know that this is a particularly new strategy, but I think it's one that um, it, it is new in terms of um, within the applied behavior analysis um, research. But you know, making sure that making sure that children have, I guess, as a, as a means to promote their autonomy and their voice and their choice, making sure that they have safe ways to opt out of um, any activities that you know, that, that might trigger trauma responses or that upset them in, in any way. Um, so whether that be like a safe space or a break space or a cozy corner or something like that. Um, and I think in, um, to offer them an alternative to escalating challenging behavior, basically offering them a safe way to, to opt out and to sort of make their, make their voice heard by, you know, basically expressing that I, I don't like this, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to make that decision for myself um, and then respecting and honoring that choice. I think in the past, at least within the behavior analytic community, there's been a lot of sort of fear that like, oh, but if you let if you let kids just escape, you know, whenever that they, they want, then they're never going to come back to the class. They're just, you know, going to stay in the peace corner all day and you're going to inadvertently reinforce their challenging behavior. But actually what, what research is, is starting to show is that if kids feel safe enough, to, well, that first, that that's a skill in and of itself to sort of learn to discriminate times when they do need a break and what to do when I do at those times. And then second, if they, if they feel safe enough to know that they aren't gonna be forced into anything that they don't wanna do, that can actually make them more likely to opt in to intervention and instruction willingly <laughs> rather than, you know, sort of being rushed or, or, or forced into it. Um, so I think that's an important strategy to make sure on a, on a, um, on the preventative side that kids have ways to express both that that they like something and want to keep doing it, but also that they don't like something and need a break from it and giving them an, a modeling and teaching and reinforcing um, appropriate ways of showing that. Mm -hmm. I think that goes so nicely um, with some of the strategies like banking time too, that is part of pyramid model where we're again, really highlighting the importance of that relationship between a child and their caregiver, right? And so it can be used in school, which is beautiful. It can also be used at home, which is really helpful too, to be thinking. Um, and I know the sort of evidence base behind it is more about building up the teacher's empathy for that child. But I think in situations like this, just for folks who aren't so familiar, banking time is an intervention where um, a child spends 10 to 15 minutes, two to three times a week for, I think like a month, um, to six weeks and they basically follow the child's lead and play. So the child picks an activity that they're really interested in and the teacher is there to support that. They're not there to teach. They're not there to ask a whole bunch of questions. They're really there to join with or join alongside that child. And we know play is so important for kids um, and is an important piece of healing too and can really support that relationship. And so as you're talking, Blair, I'm thinking, not only do we want them to be able to opt out, we want to make sure that relationship is strong enough there that they want to come, right? They want, they're receptive. They want to hear, they see that adult as someone who understands them, who sees them, who knows them and who can keep them safe. Um, Karis, I know I don't mean to put you on the spot here, so please, um, but I know, I wonder if you have any considerations around um, your work with children with disabilities um, who've also experienced trauma related to um, understanding what children are communicating or even the selection of, of different strategies to include in a behavior support plan. I don't know if you um, had anything else to share about that here um, or as it relates to other things we've talked about. No, I don't have anything to add, really. I think um, Julia and Blair have hit the nose on the hit the 
I can't think of the pun, but they're yeah. spot on. <laughs> um, I, well, the only thing I would actually add is for children with disabilities who are also um, children of color who have experienced trauma is to make sure that um, the materials that we're selecting for intervention are um, reflective of them uh, because this could impact whether they want to come to the intervention or not. Um, for example, um, we, um, in the school district that I am now, a uh, preschool classroom, um, we're implementing um, a functional communication training program, which is like traditional ABA practice. And um, we were thinking about for this one particular boy with um, with limited verbal, verbal communication, implementing a talker for him. And someone had said, oh, okay, well, how, so let me give you a little bit of context. He was engaging in what we consider aggressive behavior during play. Um, and again, this, um, if we were to take a step back, instead of saying aggressive behavior, we would reframe that by saying, well, what has happened to this child? And that would help with how we're interpreting his behavior. So instead of aggression, we would interpret it as fear, which would also impact how we would respond um, in our relationship with him, right? So um, I so I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but we need to think about um, how we're defining behaviors and how we're viewing behaviors because that impacts how we respond to children relationally. But getting back to the materials, um, we wanted to teach them how to request help or how to um, request help for a toy from a peer or an adult instead of engaging in um, this fear response. And so uh, we had a talker and someone on the team had mentioned, okay, well, he we can't program his voice on there because he has limited verbal communication. Uh, maybe we could have his teacher uh, put on the talker um, you know, help. And I mentioned, well, the teacher is white and female. <laughs> Do you think he would orient to a toy that's not representative of his voice? And so um, we really thought through how to um, circumvent that by thinking about um, another Black boy in a uh, school who uh, was of similar age and whose voice and prosody and speech um, would um, or t tone, I should say, prosody and tone matched um, the little boy that we were working with and we programmed his voice on the talker. And so um, to um, for that intervention session and he responded really well. And I don't have any experimental data to show, did he uh, respond, did he orient better to the talker that had his voice versus the white teacher's voice? I mean, that would have been a really cool study, but it just serves as kind of like anecdotal information that is really important for us to think carefully about the materials that we're selecting for children with disabilities who have experienced trauma, who also um, are children of color so that we're not re-traumatizing them because the materials, every aspect of the intervention session is about relationship. It's not just about people, it's things, it's the environment, it's the climate, it's it's all of um, all of those aspects. So. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, Karis, that's such an important point. And even then I was like, and it brings us back to the family partnerships that we were talking about too, right? Um, okay, um, and really related to what um, you were just talking about too, Karis, uh, this last question, Blair, I'm hoping you might have some insight about uh, when a child's not responding to, um, to the team's use of the strategies outlined in the behavior support plan, the way that they would have hoped or would have anticipated that a child would be responding in terms of maybe learning a new learning to use um, a new skill to better communicate what they were communicating um, with the behavior that the adults were finding challenging. Um, you know, there's typical steps that we would we would take. We would ensure that we're getting accurate data like Karis just reminded us about and that we're checking to make sure we're implementing the plan as it's designed, that we're ensuring that what we're assuming is reinforcing for the child actually is. And, and maybe even looking back to make sure that we've identified, you know, the true reason for why the child's engaging in challenging behavior. Um, but when we're supporting a child who has had experiences of trauma, what signs might indicate a misalignment between the plan and the child's trauma-related needs? And then how would you maybe modify your approach once you've identified this misalignment? Okay, so I, I think this is a this is a hard question, but I'm gonna do do my best here. So I think um, if we can take a, a little bit of a step back to to ask, like, okay, how do we know whether a plan is or isn't is or isn't working? First of all, and then if it's not working, what what might we do? Um, 
first, I feel like one important thing to say, and that has been alluded to so far in this discussion, is that um, there's not going to be a, a quick fix. Like, like it, it is very unlikely, especially for, for complex, challenging behavior that's influenced by a range of factors, you know, among them histories of trauma. It's very unlikely that an individualized behavior support plan even that is collaborative and high quality and incorporates all of these procedures is going to boop, get rid of, you know, the, the challenging behavior um, immediately. So I think step one is to be open to like gradual, gradual shifts and changes. I think another really important thing to think about is that uh, overly focusing on the challenging behavior as the primary outcome could lead a team down the wrong path. So while challenging behavior is, is an important outcome, um, I think you know it's possible that the, the number of outbursts might not rapidly decline, but their severity or their intensity or the amount of time that it takes for a child to sort of recover or, or um, you know, sort of, sort of come down from an outburst might um, shift and might be, you know, might not show an immediate um, or, you know, significant decrease in frequency of those challenging behaviors, but the quality or their severity might be shifting and to pay attention to that because that could, that is definitely an indicator of progress. I think maybe even more important than that, though, is to be on the lookout for other signs of whether the child is engaging in what's happening in the classroom, whether they're participating, whether they're communicating, whether they're interacting with peers, whether they're interacting with um, adults in the classroom, um, maybe their affect changes. Um, you know, we, my students and I worked with one um, kindergarten student last year and um, he, all of a sudden, you know, a couple of weeks into intervention, his teachers kept coming up to my students and saying, he he can talk so much. He's, ta he's talking now. We didn't know he could talk. He's telling us this and he's telling us that. He's telling us what he likes. He's telling us what he doesn't like. And, you know, that paying attention to things like that as a really critical indicator of, of progress or what I've heard Julia describe as, as healing, you know, that may not be, you know, if we're sort of just have tunnel vision on, you know, total number of instances of challenging behavior that we might miss. So it's not to say that teens should have to collect and um, account for, you know, 20 different outcome variables, but to make sure that as a team, you're really thinking about, okay, if this trauma-informed behavior support plan was effective, what would we hope, like what good things would we hope to start seeing and having some process in place to document those things in addition to challenging behavior? And then I think if, you know, back to part of your question, you know, around how do you know if it's misaligned and what to do, you know, if you're not seeing the reductions in the interfering behavior and you're not seeing any positive changes or you're seeing continued, you know, withdrawal in the classroom, avoidance in the classroom, escaping, running away from individuals, signs of stress, signs of distress, then I think that would be a pretty clear indicator that, you know, the, the support plan isn't maybe doing what it's supposed to. And then I wish there were, were an easier answer than this, but you know, it, this is a collaborative and iterative process. So I think that the team would just need to reconvene, come together, share information you know, from their various vantage points and come up with some modifications that are in line with that, you know, with those sources of information about that child and go from there. Thank you for that. Um, I'm muted because as you all are talking, I'm like making the yes, uh -huh, like the noises and then I'm glad I'm muted. Um, Julia or Karis, did you have any thought, uh, additional considerations about that? I was just going to say too that I think this is a place where it's really important we're checking in in other environments. So if that child is in individual therapy or family therapy, for example, or checking in with their family, Sometimes, right, the intervention we're putting in place has ripple effects out. And so we might be seeing huge progress outside of school where maybe those relationships are a little more established or they feel a little safer, right? And so we may have seen a huge decrease in something at home 
And that means maybe the support we're putting in place is actually creating, you know, and when I say healing, I'm, I'm talking about like, I'm feeling safe here. Wow. Now when I'm with my person, I can really shine or I'm really feeling good. Right. And so how do we, um, like Blair was saying, hold some of these other maybe non-traditional markers too. And I think it's just another plug for how important it is to have families on with us and collaborate with us because we might not know what that experience looks like. We might not know what's happening in those other arenas if they're not there to lend that voice um, and to share that with us. And so I would just hold that as a marker as well. Um, I think we'll we'll need to wrap up here soon, but I don't know if any of you have final thoughts or final things to to emphasize before we hand it back over to the to the NCPMI team. Um, anything we really want to we didn't plan for this part. I just totally threw that in there. No. <laughs> I'll, I can just share briefly that you know we don't have. We don't have a, a very deep literature, empirical literature to draw from yet at the specific intersection of trauma-informed practices and individualized behavior support plans. I think that's that's like definitely coming down the pike. But I think a lot of a lot of um a lot of this work is really happening. It's it's, it's like what's happening in practice can be ahead of the research in, in some areas. And I think this may be one of them. So I'm seeing seeing some comments in the chat about you know participants sort of feeling empowered to mm -hmm. to you know engage in this interdisciplinary you know collaborative process and I think that um, I think that you know because components of the because the individualized behavior support process is ultimately data based and you know if it's not working you're going to know and you're going to be able to make make adaptations and decisions that that practitioners should feel empowered to. Um, to, to try things, you know, things that especially are in line with these pillars and principles of trauma-informed care. Um, and, you know, I, I again, who, who said something about the least dangerous, make the least dangerous decision or something. I think all of these things that we're talking about are, are only going to be helpful, not only to students who do have histories of trauma, but to, to those who, you know, may have histories of trauma that we don't know about. Um, and, and to all students and children. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's a wonderful way to wrap it up. And I just know everybody, I can tell by the chat and everybody just appreciates all of your perspectives and expertise so much. And um, maybe we'll bring y'all back for a part three as well. Um, but I will I will hand it over to um, our team in in Florida and just thank you so much to each of you for putting so much time and effort and consideration into sharing with us today. Thank you so much, Jackie, and to our panelists for their thoughtful insights. Your feedback is very important to the work we do. Please remember to provide your feedback on this webinar with our post-webinar survey by typing the webinar address shown on this slide into your internet browser. Uh, your certificate of attendance will appear once you submit the survey. We invite you to visit our website, challengingbehavior.org, to sign up for our upcoming webinars, access recordings, download pyramid model resources, and more. Thank you to our funder for making this webinar possible. This now concludes our webinar. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.